So first of all, thank you to the C and the EN team uh, for creating this wonderful event. Um, I have to say they're, they're the most dedicated team I've ever worked with because they've asked me for more pictures than I ever took in my life. Um, so I'll be asking you for pictures in, in the future. Um, now, as you may gather, I'm actually a theorist by training. I will not take you through a theory talk today. I guarantee you half of you will leave, so, so I won't do that today. What I will tell you about is a new paradigm that my lab, in, crab, in collaboration with some, some very excellent engineers at Brown, uh, have been thinking about, which is how can we use molecules to serve as a computer? So the way we've been thinking about this is by thinking about putting small molecules in a solution and using the identity of those molecules to store information and also to perform different computational operations. So today I'll talk a little bit about that. Now, my motivation for this is actually the Fujitsu FACOM 655 line printer from about the late 1970s or early 80s. Uh, and so this printer sat in my basement for quite some time. Um, my father was the conventional computer geek, and he was one of the first people to get into the sort of the confluence between computation and transit way back when. So if you know of EasyPass, he was one of the founders of EasyPass. Uh, and so he used it because it was incredibly compact. Um, but what I remember it for is something very different. It was a totally awesome hiding place. So, so this was me at about five years old, and, and I used to frequently hide in here. And in fact, all the kids from, from my block would come if they weren't playing stickball on the street and, and come in our basement and turn out the lights off, and we'd all you know, sort of hide in our different places in, in these printers. Um, and so it was that compact back then uh, that, in fact, I could actually hide in it. But we can even go to, to worse situations. Uh, so I should say this is the rest of my basement until about five years ago. Um, we can go to worse situations, and so here's my, my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather was one of the original mathematicians who worked on the UNIVAC and actually programmed it to predict the 1952 election. And needless to say, of, of course, the UNIVAC took up even more space than that, right? It was super compact for 1952, which meant the entire room w was basically filled. Why I'm pointing these things out to you today is because of the fact that you should remember uh, that there's been an exponential growth in, in computation. So just looking at the compactness of all of those different devices, you can see that we're on an exponential trend. And of course, that exponential trend ha has allowed us to realize many of the benefits of modern day technology and modern day society. Uh, and so uh, right now, we're, we're almost at the point where we're approaching um, the number of computations that we can perform uh, being similar to that of different types of animal brains. Uh, and so you know, I'm not going to go into this. I'd love to talk to you about that. But um, you, know, you can imagine what, what will go on here. Um, but the key point is that this exponential increase has really been feeding all of the different things that have been evolving in technology. And the underlying law for this is Moore's law, right? So in 1960, Gordon Moore, uh, one of the primary founders of Intel, um, essentially articulated that every 18 months, the, the number of transistors that you can put on a chip uh, will double. And so, so this is the number of transistors you can put on a chip. And you can see that it's, it's essentially growing exponentially. But there are a lot of key signs suggesting that Moore's law is actually reaching its end, if not that it hasn't already reached its end. So if you look at other indicators of, of what's going on in computation, such as thermal power design and clock speed, those things have actually already turned over. And so, yes, computational scientists are coming up with a bunch of tricks uh, in order to keep us on this exponential trend, but this should be somewhat frightening to you. The fact that we're actually turning over means that our, the pace of our society is also not going to grow uh, just as it was previously. There are other problems that we're facing in computation, and, and one of those problems is actually big data. So big data is great for all the movies that we want to you know, see on the airplane, um, but we're producing so much data that we actually can't store it. So society in general, over the course of a year, produces roughly 2.5 exabytes of data. Uh, in 2013, we produced 4.4 zettabytes of data. And we've actually gone up to 44 zettabytes of data, and we'll, we'll be here very, very shortly. So we're producing huge amounts of data, but let's just say the amount of storage media that we have to store this data uh, is, is falling far beyond the this, this same exponential curve. In, in the data that we're producing. So we can produce a ton of things, but we have no way of actually storing those things. And that's, of course, a, a fundamental problem. So one might ask, can we actually go to something super, super compact? So I showed you compact from the 1980s, but we can think of molecules as actually being much more compact than any of the, the, the silicon devices that we create today. Uh, so in the previous slide, uh, if we go up here, 
Um, if we look at the size of transistors, um, many transistors are approaching 10 nanometers or less. So we talk about 10 nanometer fabs, 7 nanometer fabs. We're on the roadmap to, to 5 nanometer fabs. If you want to think about what things are actually smaller than 5 or 10 nanometers, you know, molecules very easily fit that bill, right? So if we think about nitrogen bonds, we think about DNA, these are on the order of nanometers or smaller. And so the key question that I'm going to pose to you today and what I'll show you today is that, in fact, you can compute on things that are naturally of this dimension in a real way, right? We can store real amounts of data uh, in these types of molecules. Now, just to give you the, the exercise for why you might be interested in doing this, if it's, if it's not obvious, uh, is that, you know, I'm a theorist. I like back of the envelope calculations. So if I do a super messy calculation and I think of this glass of water and I count up all of the molecules in this glass of water, um, if each and every one of those molecules can store a, a bit of data, just one bit of data is my assumption, um, then we would be able to store 200 Empire State Buildings uh, of terror drives, uh, terabyte drives of data um, in the same space, right? So we're, we would be able to shrink 200 of these into a single glass of water. Um, now, of course, we can't use every single molecule, we're certainly far from it, in that glass of water to store data. But if we did, you can see exactly how much we'd be compressing. Now, the other reason why I'm not completely crazy about the things that I'm talking about is, is of course, we already store tons of important information in molecules. Right? So the, the old way of doing this, uh, the very old way of doing this, is, is in DNA but also in the other metabolites that, that live in your body, right? Uh, so DNA stores 1.5 gigabytes, which is your human genome. Uh, and that 1.5 gigabytes, uh, the DNA does a great deal of, of computing operations on. And so we know that there is something fundamental about molecular computation being compact and also very, very efficient. So what did we do? How did we actually make small molecules into a computing device? So the idea behind, interesting slide, um, the idea behind uh, how we got here is that we decided to take a bunch of uh, small molecules. These are specifically Oogie products, so I'll show you these in a second on a better slide. Uh, and we realized that you can store information in these by changing the different R groups involved. So earlier we heard a talk about combinatorial chemistry. Right? If you take a few different uh, R groups, you can actually rearrange them in thousands to millions of different combinations. And so what we decided to do is to store information in the identities of each of these molecules. Um, we realized that we could very quickly read back what the identities of these molecules are by using mass spectrometry. And so we can, we can actually look at millions uh, of different molecules all at once using mass spectrometry. Uh, and then we decided to, to store a variety of different data sets in there, so I'll show you a couple of examples, and then to compute on them using a variety of different classifiers. So to, to get into the, the specific chemistry, what we decided to do uh, were to create uh, UGI molecules, which are four component molecules um, based on the UGI reaction. So we're actually using UGI domling for, for what, if people are very familiar with this. Um, the nice thing about the, these reactions is, right, if we have four different R groups, um, and let's say we have uh, 10 versions of each, uh, then we can easily scale to 10,000 different compounds. Um, actually, we can get much larger than just having 10 R groups each, right? We can go to hundreds and thousands of R groups each, and then we're automatically of the scale of having millions of different molecules that we can store information in. The other nice thing about this reaction in particular is that it, it seems to be incredibly simple. So when we first started this project, I, I talked to some of the synthetic chemists and they said, you know, Oogie reaction, you're going to get a 99% yield no matter what you did. And I'm, I'm sort of a theorist and I said, no way, uh, but, but actually way. Uh, so, so this worked really, really well. And we, we do this all using liquid handling, which I'll show you very quickly in a second. And we get 99% yields, which is still very incredible to me. So, all right, we have all these molecules. How are we actually storing information? So here's an example. I love the Rhode Island ACS. They fund many of my programs, which I'll talk about at the end. Uh, so let's say we want to store the words Rhode Island ACS. What we first have to do is we have to convert this into binary, so zeros and ones. And once we convert this, this into binary, what we can do is we can assign a molecule to every digit in this string. And so I'm giving you the most basic way of doing this. Of course, this is not actually the way you do this. Any electrical engineer would get very angry at you immediately, but I don't want to go through the math of those things. But here's just to give you an idea. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to say that at this position, we're going to have molecule one, 
Molecule one is different than two, than three, than four. And if we see molecule one in our solution, we're gonna have a one. If we don't, we're gonna have a zero in that position. All right, so in this case, we would, if we have a zero here, we would not have molecule one in our solution. And you can do this for all of these different positions and simply detect which molecules you have and you don't have. All right, now if you wanna get really smart, instead of you know, storing uh, one molecule for each digit, you can think of storing actually blocks of things and you can think of permuting them and inverting them, et cetera. Now, in order to do all this, you actually have to do a fairly large amount of synthesis. And so when, when I first started, one of my first graduate students who had some synthetic background, uh, you know, he was actually doing this all by hand. And the complicated thing about this is, right, you have to be able to make each and every molecule correctly in the proper mixtures to store information. Uh, and so we quickly moved to AI. So this is our friendly Andrew robot, and we now have a lab site liquid handler that very quickly mixes all of the molecules that we need uh, in order to convey the information we have. And, and like I said, uh, we're using mass spectrometry. The nice part about the mass spectrometer, so right now we were able to get, acquire the, the largest mass spectrometer in all of New England. Um, we can actually read in 10 to the six to 10 to the seven different charges, which means about 10 to the four to 10 to the five compounds. We could read out all at once. Uh, so there, there's a lot of magic that goes into reading these mass spectra, but let's say we, we do that magic using machine learning. And so what we end up with overall is that we can take a picture we can vectorize it and then we can permute it, right? And so the point of permutation is to make sure that if you make an error, it doesn't uh, you know, take out one whole part of the image, it, it distributes that error. We then form our chemical vector out of different molecules. We make those mixtures, we put them into our mass spectrometer, and then we figure out based upon the, the MS spectrum exactly what image we have. So this is the image that we got out. You can see we made a couple of chemical mistakes, but no big deal. And so we're actually able to store very, very large images, and I'm very proud to say we've been able to store the most information anybody ever has in molecules. So this is actually one of our smaller images. Uh, so this is 257, 544 bits, but we can actually go to many megabytes of information all at once. And this is the largest people have ever done in small molecules, and one of the largest examples in any molecules, in fact, uh, whatsoever. So we're very proud of that. Uh, and now what we're looking towards is doing computation. Uh, so we have a few examples of how to do computation, but uh, I'll certainly impress upon you that computation is certainly non-trivial. So thinking about what molecules can do that regular silicon cannot uh, is, let's just say, occupying much of my time right now. So this is one very nice problem, but really what I wanna end with is a bigger problem that takes up most of my time. And so that's the STEM gap. So you may have thought, based upon the description that I gave you of the computation in my lineage, that I, I would have been a computer scientist from the start. Um, and suffice it to say, I, I came from a, a relatively poor background. Uh, I came from a town that did not have a good educational system, uh, where people mostly grew up to uh, acquire a high school degree and nothing further. Uh, and so I actually never knew how far behind I was uh, until I went to high school. Uh, and so I heard a couple of TJers in the audience. So TJs, uh, my enemy at Bergen Academy. Uh, so I also went to a, a magnet school, Bergen Academy. But before going there, I never even knew the difference between those that are poor and the education people receive when they're richer. So in my area, they actually group different districts. Uh, and so the A through G districts in, in New Jersey, a would mean basically Newark. Uh, J means the, the wealthiest district in New Jersey. Um, so only about 10% of us, including myself, came from these A through G districts. And of course, the population of these districts is easily 10 times as large as this 90%. And so I never even knew that disparity existed until I went to high school. And, and what I can say is that I, I was very fortunate to be plucked out and to go to such a high school, but before that, I never even imagined what these inequities were. And so over the past years, I've been equally devoted to trying to increase equity in STEM. And so two of the programs I'm very proud of are the Rhode Island Project Seed and Rhode Island Advocate Program, which fund uh, roughly 20 students a year to do scientific research in the field. And so my whole goal is to make sure that those students are also able to come up with the, the scientific advances that many of us talked about today. And so with that, I'll thank my group. Uh, so this is my, my DARPA team, consisting of many very brave engineers, uh, and my group for bearing with me when I'm not doing electronic structure. So thank you.